Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to my Dominaria Draft Guide. Now, before I dive in and get you ready to crush your Dominaria Drafts when they return to MTG Arena, I do want to remind you that if you enjoy the video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment in the comment section down below with any questions or feedback, and I do will do my best to answer your questions so that you can have a good time in this epic set that is known as one of the best of all time. In this guide, I am going to be going over format basics, then covering the top three comments by each color. I and then in the rest of the guide, I'm going to be going over color rankings and archetypes, over and under performers, and then a bunch of tips, tricks, and tidbits along the way. Starting things off, we have format basics. The main three main mechanics of the set are historic, kicker, and sagas. Historic is spells that are artifacts or legendary, and those are... Um, or sagas, and those there are cards in the set that care about that, but it's not like a major theme. A lot of the decks are only going to have minor historic packages. Kicker is actually a major player in the format because it gives a lot of decks late game and makes the games grindier because everyone has stuff to do in the late game because their early spells have kicker, so they are still relevant to top decks later on. And then sagas are a fun mechanic uh, and they are cool cards, but they're not like a theme. You don't draft a saga deck. You just have good sagas in your deck. And so uh, those are the three main mechanics. The main tribes that you need to be aware of are wizards and sapperlings. There are some payoffs for going knight tribal at the rare level, but mostly you're going to be focused on wizards and sapperlings, especially because those are two of the best decks in the format. Other format basics, Dominaria is a slow format. This does not mean that you should not be taking early plays, but it does mean that a lot of the time the game is going to be decided in the late game by, by whoever can grind the opponent out. Uh, and this is also partly because uh, early creatures are often good in the late game because of those kicker costs. They are better at blocking than attacking just due to their stat lines because a lot of them are 1-3s. So for example, we have Giju Chronicler, which is a 2-mana 1-3, that in the late game you can pay 6 mana to make it get back an instant or sorcery. Uh, I'll be talking more about it later, but it is just a classic example because a 2-mana 1-3 doesn't attack well, it does block well, makes the games go slower. But you do need to have these roadblocks so you don't get run over because there are 1 or 2 aggro decks in the format. Similarly, Caligo Skin Witch, a 2-mana 1-3 that has a 6-mana ability to be relevant card advantage. And again, Sapling Migration, 2 one ones are pretty good blockers because they do chip in nicely on roadblocks, and then in the late game you can get 4 one ones. Other format basics, late game value is the key. This is part of why uh, it it is a slow format. This is how you adapt your play style to that. When you are going to be grinding it out, you're going to be having a bunch of 1-3 sitting on the board. You're going to want to have card advantage. You're going to want to have good removal. And a lot of the time, if you can, you're going to want to splash your, for all of your best cards if you can't just put all of your best cards into your two colors. Uh, late game value is a key. Card draw is good. There are a lot of ways to draw cards, and they are usually better than you expect because in a lot of sets, uh, draw spells are too slow, but in Dominaria you'll jam a lot of card draw spells into your deck because those are a nice easy way to get value because you get a two for one every time you play a draw two spell. Um, so card draw is good and there are many mana sinks, partly due to kicker, that let you win gain value in the late game. Okie doke. Again, and then finally, if you have no late game, you have to use tempo. Uh, there are some bounce spells, there is some ways to interact, and there are ways to give evasion, which is another key to being aggressive in the format. You're going to want to have your creatures that can't be blocked by those two one ones, that can't be blocked by those one threes. You want to have ways to get them into the air or give them unblockable in some other way so that you can uh, grind and so that you can kill your opponent before their grindy late game takes over. Okay, going into the top three co top commons for each color. In white, we have number one common, Blessed Light, number two, Pegasus Courser, and number three, Gideon's Reproach. Blessed Light is nice because if you do end up with a more controlling white deck, this just answers anything. There is a decent amount of graveyard recursion in the set, especially uh, in black, so you're going to be able to exile those creatures so they can never come back, which is quite nice. And Blessed Light is pretty splashable, so if you're playing a blue black control deck and get some mana fixing, you can oftentimes splash a Blessed light so i have that at the number one spot it's also not bad in aggressive decks because you do kill the creature and can swing in you kill a creature of any size which is quite nice and you get don't have to worry about the creature blocking as you would with gideon's reproach pegasus courser does edge out gideon's reproach because as i was saying you do want to give your creatures evasion if you are trying to be aggressive and white does have the tools to be aggressive some percentage of the time and you'll want to be able to give your creatures uh, flying so that they don't get gummed up on the ground and then finally gideon's reproach it's not as good in an aggressive deck because the creature still gets to block so it will soak some damage, but it is nice in those controlling decks, and it does kill a lot of relevant threats in the format for only two mana, which is a nice tool. So definitely the number three white common there. Uh, moving on to blue. Blue, I will say, is the best color in the set. So it has a ton of commons that are absolutely fantastic, but at number one is Cloud Reader Sphinx. This card is absolutely fantastic. A 3-4 flyer is like the biggest flyer uh, 
that you'll be seeing so it just tangles really nicely in the air gives you a win condition and when you have five mana scry two is almost as good as draw a card because when you have five mana a lot of the time you don't want that sixth land and so you'll scry away a land and uh essentially get virtual card advantage that way at number two but very close in the second is blink of an eye this card is absolutely fantastic it gives you early interaction if you really need it but a lot of the time you're going to want to save this to pay four mana bounce a card a non-land permanent and draw a card Notably, you can bounce your own spells. So one thing you can do is uh, when you have a saga, uh, the, the trigger for the third step of the saga goes on the stack. Uh, it will then try to sacrifice itself. And in response to that, you can blink of an eye it back to your hand. So you can get some nice value that way. You can also just bounce your creature out from under a removal spell to protect it that way, or just bounce your opponent's creatures to buy yourself time. And all the while you are going through your deck if you are paying that kicker cost. And then finally, Divination. This is the number three blue common, which is very shocking. And it was a big development in the format once uh, I discovered this i know my win rate definitely went up because divination just lets you get cheap card get card advantage very easily you don't have to go through any shenanigans of like blowing out your opponent's removal spell with a blink of an eye in a specific circumstance or uh going into the late game and trying to two for one your opponent with a removal spell or things like that you can just use your divination draw two cards be up on resources compared to your opponent which is really nice for grinding through the late game there are a host of other great blue commons blue is definitely very deep and uh it's one of those colors that it's pretty easy to get into just because its commons are all so good moving on to black the number one common in black is eviscerate just to destroy a card creature for four mana is quite nice at number two is vicious and it's also quite splashable vicious offering is next there are quite a decent number of 1-1 one, one, uh, creatures running around, specifically sapperlings, so you'll oftentimes be able to sacrifice a, a small meaningless creature to kill something bigger, which is quite nice, and also the minus 2 minus 2 can be nice as well, if you just need to kill something smaller, so Vicious Offering is definitely number 2, and then number 3 does drop down a bit, but Death Bloom Thalad is just going to be rock solid, it works well into pretty much any black deck, I mean, you just get a good blocker or a solid attacker or just gum up the ground get an extra token when it dies for your sapling synergies which is just quite nice moving on to red red is one of the weaker colors in the set but definitely can still tangle and does make up one of the components of one of the best decks which is blue red wizards and at number one is ship and fire which is an absolutely fantastic common you can either kill a small creature early in the game or kill something bigger later on in the game which is quite nice you can use uh, the kicker cost to kill things like cloud reader sphinx and it just has a lot of flexibility and is very powerful next up is gichu chronicler and this uh does harken back to those two mana one threes that we showed earlier of course i did show gichu chronicler and one thing i want to say about cards like that cards like the chronicler cards like the uh uh Calico skin, Calico skin Witch and Sapperling Migration are the, they are the type of card where on turn two, they're not super good. Their two mana one three is not great. But a lot of the time, because this format's not super aggressive, if you are playing a more controlling deck and it looks like your opponent is as well, don't feel rushed into playing your Gitu Chronicler. If you feel like you can just wait until you have six mana, it's totally okay to just be like, okay, my opponent's not pressuring me. I don't have to just play my two mana one three to chip in for two points of irrelevant damage. I'd rather just save it to buy back my Rumble spell later. That is totally okay. And Gitu Chronicler is a really nice value card and you can there are some ways to like recur it from the graveyard in black red to get some nice little loops going and number three i have fiery intervention just a really nice like it kills any most of the things you care about in the format uh and is just not like the most efficient card but it gets the job done next up is green and coming in at number one which may be a surprise is sapperling migration it is quite close with lanoir elves i will say and i would not fault someone for taking lanoir elves over sapperling migration but one of the things about this set is that a lot of the games go long and when you draw lanoir elves outside of your opening hand a lot of the time it functions as if you had drawn a land which is not ideal for a uh, format where you're just trying to grind out your opponent because the one one is not going to be super relevant whereas sapling migration you can either use it early to gum up the ground and then later you can make four one ones and have a lot of uh, like tokens to do various things within the black green sapling deck or just to uh keep the ground stabilized while you kill them with flyers or just any variety of things i think sapling migration is fantastic and definitely worth an early pick lanoir elves is still good though you can get off to the most explosive starts in the format if you do have lanoir elves in your uh, opening hand so it is still worth taking early and playing and then at number three is grow from the ashes one of the best tools for splashing in the set a lot of the time you can go uh on turn 
on turn five, uh, pay the mana, get to two basic lands, and then immediately cast a two drop because the lands do come into play untapped, which is quite relevant. Sometimes you'll even be super greedy and double fix, so you'll pay five mana, get like a plains and a swamp, so you can cast, cast your blessed light and your eviscerate in your blue green deck. Crazy things like that, and grow from ashes does enable those quite well. So I think grow from ashes is the number three green common, and green is quite good as a color overall. So definitely uh, a, a good tool for splashing, ramping, fixing all that good stuff. Moving on to top three commons overall, I did want to have this slide because it is important to know where to evaluate these cards a lot of the time, uh, especially because the number one common to take pack one, pick one is Skittering Surveyor. This card is very good. It helps you fix and splash and uh, hit your land drops, which is really nice in the format. It is an inherent two for one. The one two body can actually block Sapperling's uh, little tokens pretty nicely. And overall, it's just a really nice card in the set. So Skittering Surveyor is the common that you'd be happiest to pack one, pick one, just because you know it's going to make your deck and you know it's going to make your deck better uh, in the end. At number two, I have Cloud Reader Sphinx. This is very close with Eviscerate, but I think the big bump that Cloud Reader Sphinx get is not only is it the best, like one of the best finishers in the format at common, but it's also in the best color. So if you start your draft off with a Cloud Reader Sphinx over an Eviscerate, you're more likely to end up in blue, which overall is going to increase your win rate more than if you end up in black with an Eviscerate, though Eviscerate is still quite good and ends up at number three. Moving on to top uncommons, starting off at number one, Icy Manipulator. It just does so much. Taps creatures, you can sometimes go for a tap on end step, tap on your turn to finish the opponent off, or just keep problematic things at bay. It's just a fantastic card. Definitely take it over every single common in the set, and even most rares, because it's guaranteed to make your deck and be excellent. Next up is In Bolas's Clutches. Just stealing your opponent's permanence is great. Even though it does cost six mana, it really does reward you for it, and is definitely a high pickup. At number three is the Eldest Reborn. Just a ton of value packed into a card. This is one of the best sagas to pull off the blink of an eye trick with, where in response to the third trigger, you blink of an eye it back to your hand, and you just get a ton of value. It does lose a little bit against Sapperling tokens, which is why it has gone down a little bit to number three instead of number two, but it is still an absolute house, and you should be taking this and even splashing it aggressively if you can manage to get Skittering Surveyors or Grow from the Ashes to fix. Moving on to the color rankings, blue is by far the best. It is deep, it has tons of good synergies with the other colors, and just does everything that this format encourages you to do. So blue is the best color. Next up is green. Green often benefits from the fact that it can splash into other colors for some of their best cards using Grow from the Ashes. And green is also just a great color filled with lots of uh, good play, early plays that are also good late game because green does have a decent amount of kicker spells. So green is a fantastic uh, color as well in the set. Next up is black. Black has great removal. Black has good late game as well because it does have card draw, some kicker creatures of its own, but it does have slightly worse commons overall and slightly worse uncommons than blue and green. Next up is red. Red is still a pretty solid color it does pair nicely with black and uh blue specifically uh but there's just not as much power in that color and then white is also is, is the worst color in the set because this format does not really reward aggression and some of white's cards do skew towards that aggressive end of the spectrum so white is the worst but by no means unplayable and blue is by far the best and you should try to end up blue if at all possible Moving over to some archetypes, I do want to highlight specific cards for these top tier archetypes because Adelie's the Cinderwind is a great card in these blue-red wizards decks and pretty much a good indication of what these decks are trying to do. There are two different versions of the blue-red deck. There is one that is more spell-based where you have a more controlling strategy. You use cards that generate your value like your Gitu Chroniclers to slowly grind your opponent out with good blue-red spells. Red for some of the removal spells, blue for card draw, and win with some minor wizard synergies. And then there's the more aggressive version that really uses is Adelie's Well, where you curve Wizard into Wizard into Wizard into maybe Tempo uh, spell, like a Wizard Academy Journey Mage does bounce opponent's creatures so you can get the Tempo them out and kill them before they can stabilize. So there's a more aggressive version that uses Adelie's, and there is a more controlling version that will still play Adelie's and still have Adelie's be quite good, but is more focused on just playing good blue-red cards, because blue-red does have nice card uh, synergy between each other. Next up is Black-Green, and it does feature Slimefoot the Stowaway as a highlighting un uncommon of what the color combination is trying to do. Basically, uh, this, it has a lot of Sapperling synergies, a lot of Sacrifice synergies. Uh, Thalid Omnivore is a very good card in this deck and just lets you take over the late game by forcing your opponent to chump every turn. Uh, Slimefoot is a great late game card in this deck, just making those 1-1 one -one Sapperlings. And overall, this deck really just grinds your opponent out slowly but surely. It doesn't use blue cards, but there's d good ways to generate value in both black and green as well. And uh, Slimefoot the Stowaway is one of the best cards in this deck. You don't need Slimefoot to play this deck. I just kind of highlights what this deck is doing. Blue-green is also a fantastic 
fantastic deck. It oftentimes splashes around. It has uh, access to grow from the ashes to splash black removal spells if it really needs interaction or maybe red interaction spells. And uh, Tatyova is a fantastic card. One trick I want to mention with Tatyova is that you oftentimes want to wait until you can make a land drop immediately. So you don't play her on turn five and let her get killed. You play her on turn six and go Tatyova, immediately make your land drop so that you get that value, even if your opponent does kill the Tatyova. And if Tatyova sticks around, you're going to win the game. Uh, I just wanted to highlight those three uncommons for those color combinations because I didn't quite get to fit them onto my top uncommons list, but they are all fantastic. Moving on to the middle tier archetypes, blue black just has a ton of value cards, tons of great card quality, excellent control deck. Black red is also a great control deck. It has a little bit less in the way of card draw than the blue black deck, but it does have some nice little value engines. Giju Chronicler plus Soul Salvage is a particularly good value engine that you can oftentimes assemble. And black red also gets... Uh, just good removal spells as well blue white is next uh it just uses the good blue cards and then it can either pair those with uh the more tempo based white cards uh to with some flying or it can just pair them with white removal spells like blessed light and overall it's just a great color combination that also can sometimes feature a combo finish between on sarah's wings and cold water snapper more on that in the combos section of the guide red green just has decent card quality decent creatures and uh oftentimes can splash into other colors as well uh, using the green fixing if you can get it from the grow from the ashes namely uh, but it's just got solid card quality in the low tier uh, green white white black and red uh, white do fall to the lower tier. Those decks oftentimes rely on being more aggressive. Uh, green white can be a pretty solid go white tokens theme so it can have some nice punch into the late game because you can oftentimes just buff up your tokens with some uh, like big effects that uh, give counters to all your creatures or things like that but uh, it is a little bit less reliable because you do need to get those token makers and the colors don't naturally mesh together as well black white uh, sometimes has a uh, historic theme but that's not super well supported and so it's generally just a collection of white and black cards which can still get the job done if you have high enough card quality and then red white is in the lowest tier because it's mostly going to be an aggressive color combination its theme is not well supported the theme is uh, to put auras and equipments on your creatures or things like that and and uh, that's not really well supported and not really what this format is about. So red white is still playable, but not a deck that you'd hopefully end up in. Moving on to the combat tricks of the set. These are not all of the combat tricks, but these are the ones that you should be afraid of because these are the ones that are the most relevant and most likely to get played. And the other ones are mostly not going to get played. In white, there is Adamant Will. Uh, it does encourage you to kill creatures on your turn so that your opponent can't Adamant Will to protect their creature. So keep this one in mind, not only for combat, but also for removal. Fungal Infection is one of the more devastating combat tricks because giving leaving behind a 1-1 Sapperling can be quite nice if you can use it to swing a combat. For example, if you attack your... 2-2 two, two into their 2-2 two, two, and they block and you fungal infection it feels like you really got away with something even though it might seem pretty minor but fungal infection is a sleeper good card and it's one that you want like one copy of it in like almost all your black decks just because it does one to two copies because it just does so much uh and next is befuddle this card is actually playable in the format which is kind of funny because there are, have been formats where this card is printed where it's not particularly playable but this one does nicely when you can facilitate it on defense to get some double blocks on your opponent's creature might be a three four you befuddle it double block it and all of a sudden you go up a card which is quite nice run amok is one of the scarier tricks in red this is really the prime one to be afraid of if your opponent is a red deck and they are making a suspicious attack plus three plus three is actually pretty big for this set and trample can be pretty scary so be aware of run amok and try to blow it out with your removal spells if you can next is arbor armament this one doesn't get played a ton but uh, sometimes decks will play it just because they need answers to flyers so if they do have one green mana up and it seems like they might have something keep arbor armament in mind gift of growth can be one of the scarier tricks as well because the untap can be quite uh, hard to play around and because it can get plus four plus four sometimes you can really get blown out but uh, definitely a card that certain decks aren't going to want access to uh in the more grindy format i will say in general uh combat tricks go down in value because your opponents oftentimes are going to be able to play around those or you're not really pressuring them to block so you can't get your value from your combat trick because if they don't have mana up they're just going to say okay i'll take two damage from your creature and then you don't get to use your gift of growth and, or any of these combat tricks and your opponent just takes the damage and then next turn they pass the turn back to you and they have mana up so you can't use your combat trick into open mana so overall i will say that combat tricks in general go down at quite a bit in this format but these are the ones that you can play and gift of growth is pretty solid when you need a combat trick and then finally wild onslaught it is an uncommon but it is one to be worth uh, that's worth noting because you can get to eight mana in this format and this is one of the payoffs for a go wide deck or even just a deck that has a lot of creatures in it uh if your opponent makes a suspicious attack definitely consider wild onslaught and how that card could blow you out because there's oftentimes situations where they'll make an all-out attack and if you know they could have wild onslaught 
you can make some double blocks, you can make some triple blocks that make it so you don't get blown out by this card, and oftentimes it is correct to do so. Moving on to the fixing in the set, we've already talked about Skittering Surveyor and Grow from the Ashes. I do want to briefly touch on Navigator's Compass. This card was a hotly debated topic because it was initially very low in the format, and then um, there was a Pro Tour where certain players did quite well with decks using Navigator's Compass, so then everyone was like, oh, Navigator's Compass is quite good, but overall the card is still bad, and I would recommend against playing it. The... Uh, fact that you go down a card, you don't draw anything, you just gain some life, which doesn't generally matter in the format like this, it means that Navigator's Compass is best relegated to the uh, non-playable categories. And when you see your opponent playing this, you know that you're either in very good shape or that your opponent is like a master, really knows what they're doing, uh, and is going to destroy you with some crazy brew. But overall, I would recommend against playing Navigator's Compass. I do not play it myself, and I recommend others do not play it because the card just doesn't do enough on its own, and you'd rather have good fixing in the form of Skittering Surveyor or Grow from the Ashes, and other than that, you don't really want to be uh, splashing around too much. Next is Llanowar Envoy. This is kind of like a Prismite, but it has a slightly better body, and it does force you to be in green, but it's definitely a card that you can use to supplement a splash. You don't want to use this single-handedly to support a splash, because you don't want to be like, oh, I have my 3-mana three 3-2, three but I can't trade with it in combat, or I can no longer cast my spells. So if you have like a Grow from the Ashes and like an Island, and you're trying to splash blue, uh, you can use Llanowar Envoy to help with your splash. You might be more likely to play it, but you should not count it as a source of the color when you are splashing. Similarly, Song of Frailies can also help you splash because the creatures can add mana of any color on the first couple tunes of the saga, but the, that's not really a reliable splash either because you want to be casting Song of Frailies oftentimes in the early game to facilitate ramping out and then having a massive turn where all of your creatures are huge, and that doesn't that doesn't work if you're saving your Song of Frailies just so you can cast your other splash card. So Song of Frailies is fantastic, and it does help you with splashes if you do have a couple splashes, but it's not a card that, again, it's like a Lanoir Envoy in that regard when it comes to fixing, so I would not view it as like a source of a color or anything like that. Moving on to some trap cards. These are cards that if you've never drafted the set, you might think, oh, this card could be pretty good, or oh, this is a thing that maybe the set is telling me to do, but they are traps and things you should avoid. First up is Sage of Latinam and Orcish Vandal. They tell you that when you sacrifice an artifact, you can get value but the fact is there's just not artifacts to sacrifice if you go in oh this is an uncommon clearly it's a build around for a color combination that is not the case these cards do not see play because they are not supported in the set and you should avoid them Next up is Chainer's Torment. A lot of time there's a temptation to go, oh, it's a Saga. Sagas get me a lot of value, but Chainer's Torment does not get you enough value. It does a lot more damage to you than it does to your opponent. And in a format with so much good removal and blink of an eye to bounce the token that you make after it's done you a bunch of damage, it is not a card that I would advise playing. Next is Goblin Warchief. This is another one where it's like, oh, Goblin Warchief is in the set at Uncommon. Maybe there's a bit, little bit of a Goblin theme, but the Goblins are just not supported as an archetype and is another thing you should just avoid and not uh, play. Next is Triumph of Gerard. Again, it's similar to Chainer's Torment where you think, oh, there's so much value to be gained, but there is so much removal in this set. There's so many good removal spells, and there is, again, blink of an eye to bounce the creature that you put all this work into that Triumph of Gerard is not playable. Drudge Sentinel, another trap. Uh, indestructible looks like a fantastic mechanic. You're like, wow, I've lost to so many indestructible cards in the past when they're rare, and this card can get indestructible. That's so good. But it turns out a 3-mana 2-1 is just not big enough. The 3-mana activation is actually incredibly costly, and the fact that a 2-1 just doesn't battle with anything is really just a huge factor in Skeletal. And Drudge Sentinel is just not a playable card. And then finally, Rat Colony. Uh, there's been a recently a lot of cards that are in sets that say like, oh, if you collect them all, you can have a really good deck. But Rat Colony is not one of those. The fact that it doesn't buff its toughness means that it's still going to trade for a Sapperling token in the at the end of the day, which just overall is terrible and not worth playing. Moving on to the combos section. I have referenced some of these before, but they are definitely key to know. The first combo is a game-ending combo between Coldwater Snapper, which is a 6-mana 4-5 Hexproof, which may not look good on the surface, but when you combine it with Arcane Flight, it becomes a 5-6 Flyer that has Hexproof still, and that can end a lot of games. If you are in a blue deck and you have a controlling strategy, but you might not think that you can win the game, putting in two Coldwater Snappers and an Arcane Flight is going to give your deck a very difficult to deal with late game, and it's definitely one that you need to be aware of, because this combo is very powerful. One way to disrupt this combo is if you use Blink of an eye on the arcane flight uh, to then block the cold water snapper. They get their arcane flight back, but then you can deal with the hexproof creature, and uh, that's just a way to combat that in the late game. Uh, then even better combo with cold water snapper if you move into white and are lucky enough get, to get it is on Sarah's wings plus cold water snapper. That then creates a five six vigilance flying lifelinker. 
which is absolutely fantastic and definitely something to be uh, terrified of if you're playing against a blue water, blue white opponent that has landed a cold water snapper. So if you can, the ways to combat this combo are to have counter magic for the cold water snapper if you know it's coming, uh, or you can bounce the aura and then block the cold water snapper and then try to kill whatever they put the aura on next. But that's definitely a scary game ending combo for blue decks. Moving on to the next combo, Gichu Chronicler plus Soul Salvage. The way it works is your Gichu Chronicler dies. You then Soul Salvage back Gichu Chronicler plus another creature play the gichu chronicler get with kicker get back soul salvage and every time you do that you net a creature so it's a really nice late game combination for grinding your opponent out in black red and is definitely something you actively want to pursue if you are in that deck because it lets you compete with the card advantage from blue decks and then finally another cool combo that is mostly employed for white aggressive decks between quende pride ephemeref and jousting lance quende gives all creatures with first strike that you control double strike and jousting lance gives your creature a first strike as long as it's your turn. So what you do is you play Quende and you joust, then next turn you play Jousting Lance, equip the Jousting Lance to one of your like flyers or something like that, and then hit them for a big chunk of damage in the air. You preferably want to put it on a flyer so that you make sure you get in for a bunch of damage. Turning your 3-2 flyer into a 5-2 flyer with double strike, it can do like 10 damage out of nowhere. So definitely something to be afraid of if your opponent does have a Quende in there in play. Moving on to some overperformers in this set, we're going to start things off with Unwind. Unwind doesn't look like much, it looks like a 3 mana negate, and oftentimes it is a 3 mana negate, but that is oftentimes playable in this set because you'll go to the late game and your opponent will have a Haymaker spell or removal spell that you just have to counter, and Unwind can get the job done. Next is Mammoth Spider. This card just lines up incredibly well against the format, and to the point where it's like actively like a green common that you pursue getting, even though in most sets that it's in, it's like a solid, like an okay card. But this card actually just lines up super well. As we've been talking about Cloud Reader Sphinx, a five mana three four flyer. Mammoth Spider just like blocks that for days and just does a ton of work in that type of matchup uh, and just stabilizes the board against for green decks. Uh, five toughness is a huge amount. And this card is actually a very good card in the format, even though it might not look it. Next is Vidalian Arcanist. Uh, this card has actually been reprinted a couple times, and in few sets where it's been reprinted, it has not been as good. But in Dominaria, it is fantastic. It is a wizard, uh, which is incredibly relevant for some of the wizard synergies in blue-red. And it is also uh, the ability to tap for instants and sorceries is really good in a set with Blink of an Eye, Divination, and a ton of other blue instants and sorceries like Syncopate, which is a counter spell that is blue X, counter unless the opponent plays X, and then you exile the spell if it gets countered. Uh, those types of spells really care about having Vidalian Arcanist because when you're using Vidalian Arcanist consistently for mana, it is a very good card, and I think Vidalian Arcanist is a uh, card that you should actively want in your deck most of the time. Next up is Fight with Fire, and this card looks good, but it performs even better than you think, because a lot of the time you might think, oh, 9 mana, that never happens in Limited. But Fight with Fire, it actually does come up, and when you do get to 9 mana with a Fight with Fire, you just win the game. Red does have Gichu Chronicler to get back Fight with Fire as well, so you can use it in the early game for its removal mode, get it back later on, and win the game in the in stream late game. So Fight with Fire is definitely fantastic. I wanted to put it, I almost put it on the top Uncommons list, uh, and I wanted a chance to talk about the card because it is a all-star in the format, so it does overperform, even though it already looks good. And then finally, Whisper Blood Liturgist. It doesn't. It looks kind of like clunky. It's a four mana two two. It can sacrifice a couple creatures to get one creature back, but it ends up playing out quite well because in black decks you'll sometimes end up with, uh, especially black green, you'll end up with a bunch of one one sapperling tokens running around, and you can then sacrifice those to get back meaningful cards from your graveyard. And there are some cool little loops you can perform if you get other uncommons or rares or things like that. And just having access to some of your best cards over and over is really nice. So if you're like a black blue, if you're like a black green deck that splashes a Tatyova Benthic Druid that we showed earlier and you have a whisper then you know that even if your opponent kills your tat you're going to get it back and keep getting value from your creatures and that's just a really nice card and it does it doesn't look like much but it actually it does perform quite well Moving on to some underperformers, we're going to kick things off with Artificer's Assistant. Uh, this just generally doesn't come together. Uh, you don't really care about a one mana one one flyer because there are ways to blank that, like the Mammoth Spider we just looked at, and taking like three or four damage just doesn't really matter a lot of the time, especially from a blue deck that's oftentimes going to be grinding to the late game. So just better leave this card in your sideboard. Next up is Keldon Overseer, and this card is not unplayable, but it is a lot worse than it looks. In a lot of formats, this card would be devastating because a three mana three one haste would be like a nice aggressive body, and then in the late game having a seven mana three one haste that steals one of your opponent's creatures can be really terrifying but the problem is is in this set there's just 1-1 one, one Sapperlings galore, and decks just block it with a 1-1, one, one, and you just feel terrible. Uh, you do want to keep this card in mind, because sometimes your opponent will like play it, and uh, you don't want to leave yourself dead on board to that, so like leave back two blockers sometimes if you are at a low life total against a red deck, but 
Other than that, Keldon Overseer is not a terrifying card in this format. Next up is Dub. In certain formats, uh, this like recently, this card has actually done more work, but in Dominaria, this is not what the format is about. It gets blown out by all the removal spells, and it's not what you're interested in. Next up is Ancient Animus. It is a fight spell. It is a removal spell for green, but generally not something you're interested in. Uh, it's just too easy to get blown out, and a lot of the time, uh, it's unreliable. Like, you can play it, but it's not a high priority. It's not one of the top green commons, and is, uh, even though sometimes the green fight spells are really good, it's generally not something you need to prioritize. And then finally, board the weatherlight. You're just never going to have enough historic cards to uh, reliably have this, like, find like hits because if you whiff on this, it's terrible. So just generally, don't play the board the weatherlight. It's not going to be worth it. Moving on to some tricky rares, uh, there are quite a few rares in Dominaria that are hard to evaluate. Starting things off with Sylvan Awakening, this card is generally not worth it. It can be fun to play, and if you do end up with like 10 lands in play, it can be a finisher for your green decks, but you're generally not going to prioritize it because you can find better ways to finish the game once you get to 10 mana. Next is the first Eruption. This is a very cool looking saga, but oftentimes it's not going to work out very well because you, there's just too much setup for the ability you really care about, which is the deal three damage to each creature, and sacrificing a land is a real cost in a format where you have good ways to spend your mana throughout the entire game. Uh, it is more of a sideboard card, but since Dominaria is only coming back for best of one to Arena, that's not going to come up as much. But if there, if your opponent was playing a Saplings deck, this is the type of card you would bring in. But overall, it's not worth main decking in best of one, just because you're usually not going to want to cast it uh, to and lose your mountain because your opponent's just going to know the three damage is coming and just play around it. Next is Lich's Mastery, which is actually one of the coolest build arounds in the set, and you definitely can get there. This type of card, this is the type of card that really incentivizes you to play Navigator's Compass because then it becomes an Ancestral Recall, which is just crazy. Um, there isn't an insane amount of life gain, but there is enough to make Lich's Mastery work, and it's one of the most fun things to do in the set when it does come together. I would caution you against it if you are new to the set, but if you are returning to Dominaria and looking for something fun to do, I think Lich's Mastery is something that is really crazy to do when it comes together and can be a lot of fun. Definitely not like a card that, uh, if you're new to the set, you can stick to d stick to simpler things and you'll still have fun, but Lich's Mastery is a cool rare to build around. Next is Helm of the Host, which looks very clunky, but ends up being just an unbelievable bomb in the set. Uh, very, very powerful. You basically just put this on any creature and then just watch your opponent lose the game, because if you can survive to equip Helm of the Host to anything, you're just going to get so much value that your opponent is not going to be able to compete. And then there's some like crazy good combos, like if you put this on an Academy Journey Mage, which is a 5-mana 3-2 wizard that when it enters the battlefield bounces a creature that your opponent controls then helm of the host plus that is just bouncing your opponent creatures every turn or you can put like it onto a flyer like a cloud reader sphinx and scry to every turn there's just a lot of combos that you can assemble with helm of the host and it's overall a fantastic card uh, you should be first picking taking every time you see it it works into every deck next up is precognition field which looks a little bit bizarre but oftentimes it is going to be worth it uh the fact that it gives you something to do with your mana in the late game you can uh sort through your draws, you're oftentimes in your blue decks going to have a lot of instants and sorceries because of your divinations, your syncopates, your blink of an eyes, all those cards, and pre ignition field is end ends up being a good rare in pretty much every single blue deck. Moving on to some final tips, I will say that most of the legendary sorceries are powerful, but you need 4 plus legends in your deck to cast them. And by legendary sorceries that are worth casting, I mean Urza's Ruinous Blast, Yawgmoth's Vile Offering, Jaya's Emulating Inferno, and Karn's Temporal Sundering. Of those four, Urza's Ruinous Blast is going to be the worst one, but it's still going to be a good card uh, if you can facilitate it. And by legends, the way that a legendary sorcerer works is you can cast, may cast a legendary sorcery only if you control a legendary creature or planeswalker. So you only want to put these cards in your deck if you have four or more legendary creatures so once you have one of these and they are worth picking relatively early a lot of the time so that you can build around them you do want to prioritize just random legendary creatures a little bit higher sometimes in the, in ex like certain situations you can get away with only three legendary creatures but uh i would advise having four plus because when you can't cast these cards they're just complete blanks there are some other legendary sources that are not worth putting in your deck kamal's druidic val and primeval's glorious rebirth there's just not enough legendary permanent cards to return from your graveyard or to flip over from your deck to make this uh these cards worth it so i don't think these ones are worth playing but the other ones are worth uh facilitating by taking those legends a little bit higher other final tips running 18 lands is often correct when you have plenty of card draw and mana sinks because you really just want to make sure you hit your third land on turn three and then you just go off to the races like you go turn three divination and then you just keep hitting your land drops the entire game keep playing more card draw spells keep holding up counter magic removal spells there's a lot of stuff to do with your mana so you can oftentimes play 18 lands if you have a lot of things to do in the late game 
uh, or if you're splashing and things like that. Another thing is artifact and enchantment to hate is main deckable. That's definitely a nice little benefit. Uh, Invoke the Divine and Broken Bond are going to be better than normal, partly because there's some artifacts and enchantments running around that are just quite powerful and partially because the games go long enough that you're going to see more of your opponent's deck. So even if they only have three good artifacts or enchantments, you're going to see them more often because the games are going to go maybe an extra few turns, so they'll draw them more often. That is going to do it for this Dominaria Draft Guide. I really do hope you enjoyed it. Remember to like, share the video with others, subscribe to the channel, and comment if you have any questions or feedback in the comment section down below leave hashtag ready to dominate dom can be capitalized if you want because it is dominaria it was a little bit of a pun just got to throw that attempt out there but it's really fun to let me know it's a good way to let me know you made it all the way to the end of the video and that you enjoyed it that is going to do it for this one i do hope you enjoyed it i hope you enjoy dominaria as much as i enjoy it and i will talk to you next time